Just as the sun regulates life on Earth, there is one part of the human body which regulates our every move and function. It is the centre of thought, speech and reasoning and helps us to maintain our place in society. What we know about the brain is probably a thousand times more what we knew about it even 50 years ago. Nevertheless, we only understand a fraction about the functioning of this most incredible organ. The human brain and consciousness exist in a delicate but vital balance, which also controls our perception of the world and our place in it. When that balance is disturbed, whether through accident or as a condition of birth, that perception can become altered and our place in society appears less certain. Investigators are now building a clearer picture of what physically happens when the brain malfunctions. From a scientist's perspective, it's obviously incredibly interesting and fascinating just to discover what are the biological underpinnings of uh, psychiatric disorders. And that's really very much an aim in itself. Two Irish researchers are working together to give hope to the thousands of people suffering from mental disorders. By working together, they offer substantial hope for earlier, more accurate diagnoses and more focused, efficient treatments in the future. Collaboration between two Irish researchers marks the beginning of a new era in the understanding of brain disorders. The work is significant because it represents the combination of two very different disciplines. Neuropsychology is the study of the connection between brain and behaviour. It's trying to link what we do with that big lump of jelly inside the skull. Professor Ian Robertson of Trinity College Dublin has dedicated his professional life to the search for a better understanding of how exactly the brain functions. There is nothing anywhere in the universe that we know about that's as complex and sophisticated as the human brain. This has the capacity for the processing of information that generates consciousness. Consciousness is the great scientific mystery of our time. How to explain how this three pounds of soft tissue produces consciousness. This is a real human brain. Brief tour of the brain. Here we have the cerebellum controlling movement. The temporal lobes, which are important in memory. Parietal lobes, important for knowing where your body is in space and where you are in space. And then very, very importantly, the frontal lobes, the part of the brain that makes us most truly human, which are involved in thinking, planning, awareness, regulation of emotion, inhibition, and sustaining your attention. Using the latest cutting-edge technology, Ian Robertson's work involves building up a picture of how exactly the brain functions as it processes information. So this is the MRI, and this is state-of-the-art. There's a relatively small number of centres in the world have these. And we are able to look inside the brain, to look at the structure of the brain, the connections between the different brain cells. But also we can get people to do mental tasks like remembering thinking, inhibiting, attending, concentrating, and we can look which parts of the brain are switched on and active. So this is a basic picture of the brain here. This is now, now the basis for when we do our functional imaging. That is when we try and look at the brain as it actually works, and which areas are more, more, more active than others. So what's interesting about that is if we look at the 
the frontal lobe of the brain here, we can look at how active that part of the brain is at different times. My own role in studying the brain is to try and understand how we keep our minds on what we're doing and how we are aware of when we make mistakes and how we're aware of what we're doing in routine tasks. The frontal lobes are critical in allowing us to carry out these routine tasks. But they are also only one component of the intricate communication network that is the human brain. So if you imagine there's billions of brain cells and each, each one of these tiny brain cells connects with up to 50,000 other brain cells. A critical part of the brain is this huge mass of wiring between the brain cells, the, the white matter, the axons, which transmits the information between these brain cells. Any, any time we talk or see something or think, there's a massive amount of toing and froing of information along these wires. So if these wires are not working properly, then that really disrupts uh, brain function. Damage to the wiring in the brain can be caused by a physical trauma such as an accident, known as traumatic brain injury, or TBI, or by an internal injury, which can happen as a result of a stroke or hemorrhage. Both types of injuries can affect the frontal lobes and have a devastating impact. He was great at everything he did. He was top of his class. You never had to worry about Michael. I suppose we were just getting to a stage where things should have been getting easier after having had seven, you know, and put them all through school. My husband was just retiring and he was having a great time with Michael and they were great friends and then this happened. At the age of 19, Michael Hartnett suffered a severe blow on the rugby pitch, which later led to a major stroke and left him fighting for his life. Michael's family tried to remain positive, though the prognosis was not good. They gave us three days. They, you know, it's, the, the swelling and everything was so, so much in his brain. I never prayed so much. There was a church beside us called St. Rita, and St. Rita is the patron of hopeless cases, and I'd have never <laughs> known about St. Rita before. I said, God, I used to go in there every day and give her hell. <laughs> so um, anyway, it worked. <laughs> Michael's stroke, which led to oxygen not being delivered to the brain, resulted in severe damage. Aside from the temporary paralysis, the specific damage to the frontal lobes left his vision, speech and spatial awareness badly affected and his ability to maintain concentration or attention still presents problems for him. So Michael has all the symptoms of frontal lobe damage resulting from a TBI. In this sense, he presents with a attention difficulties, with emotional ability, with planning and organizational uh, problems. Salvatore Giangrasso leads the team at the Headway Centre and provides rehabilitation and counselling for those who've suffered from a variety of brain injuries. Michael, can I just ask you, obviously we all know that you've made a huge progress, but attention plays such a huge yeah, role in what we can actually do in terms of how much we can use of our intelligence, if you like, of our resources. But my guess is that despite your intelligence, if you have to multitask, it might get confusing. When I get a particular task to do, um, I just, I, I'm, I'm very worried about that the whole uh, conception of, of a task. And, and it falls down on me like a, like a ton of bricks. A lot of the neurological deficits that result from traumatic brain injury recover naturally. Then there are areas that don't recover as much as, you, as we would like or should recover, in which case what, what you do is, through rehabilitation, is you put in place compensatory strategies. So that means that the brain was not able to fully recover with regard to a function, so you help the client to use external aids to perform well. 
We might train the client on how to use the reminder function in a mobile phone, diaries, or we might help the client to recognize signs and cues about things that it needs to do. There's a lot of things out in this world that I want. I want a big car, big house, big, big family, really big family. Same as my dad. There's nothing I don't want. I say per se. In studying traumatic brain injury, we're limited because we don't have a biological or genetic basis to it because it's caused by an injury. So it's very helpful for us to look to other conditions where there is a known partly biological basis, such as, for instance, attention deficit disorder. The problem there is very similar in some ways to traumatic brain injury. That is a real difficulty in keeping your mind on one thing and paying attention. So both groups tend to be forgetful and um, uh, a bit impulsive and maybe get into trouble because they, they don't think through the consequences of what they're doing. While Ian's work focuses on the functional aspects of the brain, another investigator is looking at mental disorder from an entirely different perspective. The long-term aim of our research is to understand the causes of these mental disorders. The work I'm doing will focus on the genetic aspects of the disorders, aiming to better understand the underlying biology. Professor Michael Gill of St. James's Hospital is both a psychiatrist and a geneticist and is looking at genes in an effort to better understand the human brain and the diseases that can afflict it. It's interesting to point out that a very large proportion of our genes go to make up uh, how the brain is built. The brain is the most complex organ and it requires the greatest blueprint in order to, to build it. So genetic abnormalities may determine uh, that the brain develops in subtly different ways. Some of those abnormalities can lead to a risk of developing mental disorders. As a scientist, Gill is looking at genetic information, but as a clinical psychiatrist, he also sees the symptoms of diseases such as schizophrenia, depression and ADHD at first hand. These diseases often present certain challenges, not least in the initial diagnosis. One of the difficulties in uh, making diagnoses in psychiatry is that they are dependent on this um, assessment of a set of symptoms and whether or not these symptoms are present in any given individual. And for disorders like schizophrenia and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, there is no diagnostic test, there's no biochemical test. I've been living with ADHD all my life. I was diagnosed when I was 26 years of age. As a result of the poor concentration problem, I lost out big time, particularly my education. I couldn't hold my attention for more than 10 minutes. I got easily distracted. I couldn't really make friends. You're not really on the same wavelength as other children. You don't understand them, they don't understand you. You know, that's very, very frustrating. It can just, you know, it can drive you mad, really. You know there's something wrong, but you just don't know what it is, you know, and by other, by say, teachers or, you know, basically even society, you know, you're written off as just being, you know, a no-hoper. In fact, John Conlon was one of the lucky ones. Though his diagnosis was relatively late, he's one of the 40% of ADHD sufferers who respond well to treatment. He was placed on medication soon after his diagnosis. I'm still on that medication for the last five years, which I have been since I was 26, I'm now 31. And my life has been so much better. I've since graduated from third level. I got my arts degree. Socially in my hometown, I can socialize much better now, now that I'm, you know, diagnosed and more down to earth and I suppose can relate to people a, a lot better. So it's so vital that it's got at an early stage that it's diagnosed, treated, that the kids are put on the right track. One of the difficulties with mental illness is that although treatments are generally quite effective, they're not effective across the board in, in, in all cases. And in some cases, um, the, the medications are, are completely ineffective. 
Well, do you know, when I started out in child psychiatry, unfortunately, we saw child problems as caused by mothers. We felt that mother and father weren't rearing their child properly. And that was what was causing the child problems. Now, that, that, I, I regard a lot of that as mother and father bashing. It was a very primitive kind of simplistic uh, way of looking at child problems. And it was untrue. They were born with, with their brain not functioning properly, particularly the frontal parts of their brains. It wasn't their fault. Carl McGuinness was diagnosed with ADHD a number of years ago. And unfortunately, in his case, though the disorder was identified early, to date, he has shown no significant positive reaction to the treatment. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a condition characterised by problems with attention, problems with concentration. The child is very hyperactive, is very impulsive, is always on the go, uh, is very noisy, creates tremendous problems at home, tremendous problems uh, in, in school. You've been here 45 minutes and already the ball's been kicked around the house. Playing with the dog and then getting real rough with the dog. Hiring the music when you're asked not to care. Constant supervision uh, with everything that you do. You have to supervise him all the time. And as you couldn't trust him to be left on his own. I feel sorry for him, really, really sorry for him. That he's so frustrated as well and he wants to be good and sometimes he can't be. I just want to be a normal kid and have all the privileges as a normal kid does have. Like there's little babies that are allowed to go further than I am. I just find that very hard to cope with. Carl, get down! Yeah, well, you'll have to get down. Because you're, you're the best parent in the world, you think you know everything, but you don't. Treat me like a two year old all the time. I wish I was still out playing now with all my friends. I'm not sick of you, man. Carl, before you went last year, you were out playing. You were in a robbed car. You were smashing bus windows. You were calling people names on the street. And God knows what else you were doing. Are you really telling me you never done that when you were No, I didn't, Carl. Hanging around with all the street. No, I was certainly not in robbed cars and I was certainly not doing what you're doing now at 12 years of age. Why does one ADHD sufferer respond to a treatment and another not? That is one of the key questions that Michael Gill is asking. He believes the answer is in our genes, but he knows that it's not straightforward. So psychiatric disorders are very complex, and I think we know already that you know, there's no single gene that will cause conditions like ADHD. But we're, we're expecting there to be multiple genes. Each gene will have a small effect. It will add a little bit to yours at risk to having ADHD. For instance, in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's quite clear that there may be different sets of genes involved in the attention component and other sets of genes involved in the hyperactivity uh, and then some genes are involved in both. So by perhaps breaking down the disorder in some way, we may be able to understand better the links between the genes and the brain function. As in traumatic brain injury, the attention problems of ADHD sufferers are caused by a fault in the wiring of the brain. This wiring is an organised network of millions of chemical messages being passed throughout the brain. It is known that one system that facilitates the movement of messages is linked to attention. This is known as the dopamine transporter system. Michael's work concentrated on whether or not there might be a genetic reason why the system didn't work properly in ADHD, and he made a significant discovery. So Michael Gill was one of the first people to identify that a particular form of the dopamine transporter gene um, is a risk factor for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So people with ADHD are more likely to have this form of, a of the dopamine transporter than other people. Hi guys. Hi oh, thanks. Hi, how are you? Here. Michael's identification of this genetic abnormality or variation was a major breakthrough. For the first time, a direct link had been made from a gene to the risk for developing ADHD. Furthermore, it became clear that people with this genetic variation were more likely to respond well to treatment. Here was one of the first keys to answering the question why do some people respond better to treatment than others? 
Gill had discovered a strong basis for further research, and his work generated substantial interest, especially in Trinity College, where Ian Robertson was also looking at the very same dopamine transporter system in relation to attention in traumatic brain injury patients. So what we did then was to say, was to take some of these specific problems of mental function that you find both in traumatic brain injury and in ADHD and ask, can we relate these specific problems of paying attention to the uh, genes that Professor Gill has found that are linked to ADHD? And we did indeed found um, that not only in ADHD, but also in normal people, we find, we find quite clear linkages between a specific, quite specific mental function of paying attention and a particular gene, the DAT1 gene. So here was an obvious connection between the, our two paths. His interest is in dopamine and attention and our interest is in genetics and the dopamine system and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. With their areas of research overlapping, Gill and Robertson now decided to take the relatively unusual step for a neuropsychologist and a geneticist to work together as a team. Up until now, people have worked in their own fields. Geneticists working alone, cognitive neuroscientists working alone. And people are really realising that to understand a complex disorder, you need to bring experts together in different fields. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's Having made one connection between a genetic variation and a specific brain function, Gill and Robertson's mission now is to make as many more of these connections as they can. They're doing this by conducting, in partnership, detailed studies on a wide range of participants. First part of the studies would be the patients the people with various mental disorders and uh, working with them to make diagnoses and to take blood samples and to extract the DNA. Uh, the second part of the work goes on here in the genetics laboratory where we examine the DNA variation uh, in, in, in a variety of different genes and a variety of different methodologies and that in itself is a huge amount of information which we feed into our databases. But the addition of the functional data, the addition of the psychological tests and measures is hugely valuable because it brings a whole new dimension to the studies and enables us to make much more use of the information that we already have. Michael and John are contributing to the latest batch of Gill and Robertson studies in the hope that they can be part of the search for new and more efficient treatments for the future. Well, John and Michael, thanks for coming. Okay. This is the EEG room. So we're going to be putting a fancy hat on you here to measure your, your brain waves, to try and understand better how the brain works. After this, we'll begin next door to our MRI room, where we use a big magnetic fields to study the inside of your brain. In that way we can understand better how the brain is working while you're doing different cognitive, different mental uh, tasks. Michael, what you're going to see in a moment is a number of numbers appearing on screen from 1 to 9. What I want you to do is press the red button on your keypad for every number with the exception of the number 3, okay? This particular batch of data may take us further to understanding commonalities between ADHD patients and uh, patients with brain injury. Um, so if we can examine the commonalities in terms of how these two groups of patients process errors and indeed uh, how that has a knock-on effect to how they can correct their behaviours, um, that will be a significant step forward. This coming together of the genetic and functional approaches to the brain is only in its infancy both in Ireland and internationally. But the early results of this collaboration have proved extremely promising. In the future, this knowledge could profoundly change how we understand and treat disorders of the universe's most complex machine, the human brain. Well, that's uh, obviously the beginning of some way of trying to differentiate these clinical yeah. types of, uh, on the basis yeah. of both their genetic differences, yeah. but also on the basis of their yeah. neuropsychological differences. Disorders of the mind and brain are one of the most challenging, problematic and distress-causing aspects of health problems. So it is absolutely imperative and urgent that we find better ways of preventing and treating these terrible disorders. 
Well, I think the work that um, Ian and Mike are doing together, you know, is very much at the cutting edge. And it's by bringing these technologies together gives us a whole new way to understand the brain and how that's functioning. So I think in the future that it's going to help us improve diagnostic practice, that we'll be able to target treatments more appropriately, that we'll be able to identify, you know, new and better drugs. For a clinical scientist, the understanding of mental illness is a hugely important task of itself. But for a clinician to be able to use some of that knowledge and apply that to patient care, both individual patients and future generations of patients, and for it to benefit aspects of mental illness such as stigma, improving treatments and perhaps even prevention would be hugely exciting.